Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to look at structural unemployment as a topic discussed in macroeconomics and how we can utilize microeconomic models such as the market for labor to illustrate structural unemployment. Our applied example could be the city of Detroit. And Detroit's dependence on the automobile industry, General Motors and Ford Motors, and their manufacturing plants, and how the city became very dependent on the manufacturing plants from these two car manufacturers for, the, for a significant portion of the jobs created in that city. And unfortunately, as a result of the automobile industry uh, moving their manufacturing plants to the southern United States, Canada, and Mexico, the demand for uh, employees or labor in the city fell over time. And that unfortunately led to, and, and here we can see some of the statistics here, uh, the population of Detroit falling from about 1.8 million. In 1950, which was kind of the boom in height period of the car manufacturing industry in that city to 680,000 in 2015. So that's a significant drop in the population due to yeah. the automobile industry uh, moving elsewhere in terms of their manufacturing plants. And that, that led to some social consequences and economic consequences that we can see. Severe urban dec decay, rising poverty, poverty and crime rates, shooting, drug use, and so on. Um, so that's you know, a severe impact on the city. Uh, I was not able to find unemployment data for the city of Detroit going back to 1950. But we can notice that unemployment uh, from about 2000 onward had this upward trend. It was rising. Here we see the September 11th attacks, uh, September 2001, and its impact perhaps on the rising unemployment in the city of Detroit. Um, the potential recessionary gap caused by the September 11th attack, where General Motors had a restructure, restructure they actually declared bankruptcy. Ford Motors restructuring uh, led to both GM and Ford kind of uh, pushing aspects of their manufacturing elsewhere to take advantage of lower costs of labor. And that potentially led to an upward trend in the upward in the unemployment rate. And here we see the impact of the 2008 crisis just dramatically rising unemployment in the city of Detroit from about 6% 6, 6 to a high of 16%. And then from 2009 onward, there's a downward trend, but the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, shot unemployment up to about 25%, which is just astronomical. Um, if we looked, if we had the data from 1950 onward, we would see that rising upward trend in unemployment in the city due to the falling demand for labor due to General Motors and Ford moving their manufacturing plants elsewhere. And that would create structural unemployment in the city of Detroit and structural unemployment in the nation of the US if those manufacturing plants went abroad to Canada and Mexico. And so those uh, workers in the United States that worked in as manufacturers uh, in the production of cars saw demand fall for their skills and they would become structurally unemployed. Okay, so that's some, you know, some contextual uh, historical examples that we can use to illustrate structural unemployment. So we can use, even if it's macroeconomics on an, uh, an IB paper exam, they might ask you to illustrate structural unemployment. And with the new syllabus, with the paper two, they can give you perhaps an article or data in a geographic region or in a particular city and you might see falling demand for a particular skill in that market leading to structural unemployment. So using the example of Detroit, Graph A will il illustrate the labor market in the city of Detroit. And since it's a labor market graph, it's an input graph for measuring the value of labor as a wage paid in the form of a wage on the y-axis and the quantity of labor supply and demand on the x-axis. So we can have the demand for labor by firms, General Motors and Ford, downward sloping according to the law of demand. So we'll label that D1. And we want to remember that this is the demand for labor by firms. So I'm just going to make a note. 
here, so we're conscious of that, that this is demand for labor by firms. Let me just clean that up a bit. And those firms, in this case, could be General Motors and Ford. Okay, so that could be GM and Ford Motors as the firms demanding labor in the city of Detroit. Microeconomics, we're going to remember that demand is equal to the marginal benefit. Then we can illustrate our supply of labor by households. Households in the city of Detroit supplying their labor. So we'll label this S1, which is equal to the marginal cost of providing labor into the labor market. And we're going to make a note that supply of labor is provided by firms. I'm sorry, by households. Households own the factors of production in macro, uh, microeconomics. Okay, so we have S1 equals D1. I'm just going to make where S1 equals D1. It provides an equilibrium wage, we'll call W1, and equilibrium quantity of labor at Q1. So here, we'll use this. At point A, an equilibrium sets an equilibrium wage at W1. The quantity supply and demanded for labor at Q1. Right? But as a result of General Motors and Ford moving their manufacturing plants out of Detroit towards southern United States, Canada, Mexico, the demand for labor in the city of Detroit begins to fall. So we see it fall from D1 to D2. Right? And we will hold wages constant at W1. So at a wage value of W1 at point B, we see that the quantity demanded is at Q2. But the quantity demanded is less than the quantity being supplied at that wage of wage, wage one. So there's excess supply of labor by households at that wage of wage one, at that price of wage one, uh, due to the fall in demand by firms at point B. So that puts downward pressure on wages. Wages begin to fall. And that will eventually lead to a nuclear room at point C. And as wages falls from W1 to W2, we see that in theory, the quantity demanded increases from point B to point C, while the quantity supplied for labor decreases from point A to point C until we reach that new equilibrium at point C, which is quantity at Q3. Okay, So the distance between Q1 and Q2, or I should say from Q1 to Q3, this reflects the structural unemployment that's been created due to the fall in the aggregate demand. Right? That quantity, I'll make a note here, of Q1 minus Q3, that value is equal to the structural unemployment that's been created as a result of that fall in aggregate demand. Created as a result in the fall of demand. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and analyze this as we would for paper exam. As can be seen, we have uh, a model, graph A, illustrating the labor market in a particular city, in this case, Detroit, Michigan. This model will illustrate the creation of structural unemployment. 
uh, reflecting a mismatch in labor and supply. We're measuring wages on the y-axis and the quantity of labor on the x-axis. We have two downward sloping demand curves for labor, labeled D1, D2, downward sloping according to the law of demand. And we must remember that demand is coming from uh, firms in this case, since this is an input graph. We have an upward sloping supply of labor, labeled S1, equal to the marginal cost, and the supply of labor is provided by households, households that own the factors of production. Where S1 equals D1 provides an equilibrium, equilibrium wage at W1 with the quantity supplied and demanded at Q1, right? At Q1, quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. But over time, as a result of um, the firms General Motors and Ford moving their manufacturing plants to the southern United States, Canada, and Mexico, taking advantage of lower costs of labor in those regions, we see the demand for labor in the city of Michigan begin to fall. So demand falls from D1 to D2. But we're going to hold wages constant in the short run at W1. So we see that at W1, the quantity supplied of labor at Q1 is greater than the quantity demanded for labor at Q2. That creates excess supply of labor, and that puts downward pressure on wages. So we see wages fall from W1 to W2. And as it falls, we see that the quantity demanded for labor rises from point B to C, or from Q2 to Q3, while the quantity supplied Oops. The quantity supplied begins to increase, I'm sorry, begins to decrease due to the fall in the wage, disincentivizing households to provide their wage, their labor from point A to point C. Thus, we reach a new equilibrium where S1 equals D2, equilibrium wage at W2 with the equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded at Q3. So again, here we see how we can use a microeconomic model, a labor market graph, to illustrate structural unemployment. The structural unemployment is the value of Q1 minus Q3. That is the structural unemployment that's been created as a result of the fall in demand in this particular applied example. And that's it. I will provide uh, outline analysis notes in the information section. And if you have any uh, questions, don't you can comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.